Uh, hello, everyone. Hey. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about cross-platform, building things with Ionic and Angular, uh, and really what we've been doing in Ionic to better support the greater Angular ecosystem. We are going to have a few history lessons, so without further ado, uh, let's go back a few years and think about some of the beginning things, uh, the, or learn some of the beginning parts that really made Ionic uh, what I think is a really great platform. I feel like I don't need to sing the praise of AngularJS, but when we first started building out Ionic, uh, the fact that we had this really easy framework that could let us isolate and reuse all these components, um, really, really, uh, we really appreciated that. Uh, and, you know, a lot of, it allowed us to do so many things, like create these reusable components, create list views, navigation components, uh, animations and gestures, basically recreate what, we, uh, what you would get from a native SDK, but with the web. We thought it was great, but you know, also a lot of other people did too. Huge community. Basically, if you go anywhere in the world, you could find an Ionic developer, which I think is pretty impressive. We also saw a huge amount of companies like adopt Ionic as their core stack. Uh, so whether or not you are drinking beer and want to uh, track what kind of beers you're having, uh, do some workout to get rid of all the effects of that beer, maybe uh, dive into sous vide, or just find out what show, uh, where your show is playing uh, through streaming services, um, companies all around are just using Ionic and being very successful. In conversations with these companies, we've often heard uh, this kind of phrase. The web has a mobile SDK. Um, and this is something that we really set out to uh, build. We were really frustrated with the fact that you could not uh, build a quality mobile app without having to rebuild all the pieces and all the interactions and gestures. Now, we eventually made the migration over from AngularJS to Angular. And we were you know, super excited. We had learned so much from our Angular JS days. We were like, OK, what can we do? What can we do to improve uh, Ionic and just make it a better platform altogether? Uh, we were here in NGConf 2015, across the street, Little America, uh, and just learning as much as we can, uh, we, much as we could from you know, all the Angular team, uh, and just paying attention as much as we could from all the talks. Now, we have gone through the whole process of being built on top of Angular. Uh, and that experience, while it was really great, we also started to develop our own opinions and our own thoughts about how things should be done in a mobile app uh, and how, things should, how developers should interact with pieces of their app. Uh, we, had our, we had some really strong opinions, and it, was, it made sense being a framework built on top of a framework. We wanted to build our own router because we had really strong opinions on how routing should work. We also built our own CLI because we, again, we had our, real, our own strong opinions about how an app should be built and how that should, process should work and what dependency should be used. So we went through and built all this stuff, maintained it from not only our version 2 to our version 3. And up until version 4, we were planning to maintain that for the next release. Uh, but then we noticed something. Angular kept getting better. Uh, as a platform, it really is probably one of the best places to be building apps. Uh, the Angular CLI is top notch. The router is getting even better with things like dynamic imports. And then all the other features of, the, of Angular really just make it a one of a kind place to be building apps with. So with our 4.0, we set out with a simple goal. Let Angular handle Angular. Really a simple uh, idea, but we want to make sure that we could go back to just focusing on the components, which is really what we do best. And then reuse all the pieces of Angular to kind of take advantage of everything that uh, they have already built and still provide our strong opinions. So we went off with the, probably the most difficult part, and that was routing. Now, I said we had our own routing solution. And really, you could think of it as an in-memory uh, array. Anytime you were navigating to different com uh, parts of your app, you're just pushing an entry onto an array. You navigate back, you're popping that entry off of the uh, stack, what we would call it. Now, this is the paradigm that uh, native followed, uh, that native has, and there's no URL, so when you're in a native app, you don't really need a URL to reload and maintain state. You just have this in-memory representation. 
Now that worked really well for native apps, but as progressive web apps started becoming more and more important, we realized, hey, we should probably have a URL so people can share this app. And then, okay, well now we have a URL, now we need a, you know, authentic, have some authentication or navigation guard so people can't access this part of the app if they're not logged in. Okay, well now how do we handle redirects when we go to a bad URL? You can see we're essentially recreating pieces of the Angular router, but in such a different way that people would either get confused. It's like, wait, I thought Ionic was built with Angular. Why do I have to learn all these different ways of doing things? And I think that was probably the most painful part, realizing that community members were just confused. Uh, so for 4.0, we moved to the Angular router. Pretty simple. Uh, we moved to the Angular router and we actually built on top of the router to provide all the animations and gestures, uh, everything that you would expect to get from a mobile app. So here we have on our left a uh, typical router setup that you would get from an Angular router. You have a uh, path and a component in line and then some other routes with uh, lazy loaded children using uh, dynamic imports. Fairly standard. The only thing that we have that's different is towards the bottom, we actually have this ion router outlet component. This is something custom that we built, but it builds on top and extends Angular's built-in router outlet. So with this, we get some pretty nice things like gestures and animations and transitions built into our routes for free. We don't really have to have anyone wire that up. We can disable these animations uh, basically as a property on the uh, router outlet. But you get all this stuff for free. Now, we consider this a linear navigation stack. There's only one place where routes will be rendered and where this transitions would happen. What if we want to say, do something like tabs? So any native app these days will typically have this tab bar UI where you can have independent history maintained through each uh, tab. Well, with uh, the work that we were doing with the router, we were able to maintain this by just having this really nice uh, structure of here's the top level tabs component, here is the first section of routes that I can navigate to, and within that first section of routes, here's yet another array of child routes that we could load up. You could optimize this however you want using load children uh, and split it out into your own pieces if that is something you want. For clarity and simplicity, we just did everything like this. Uh, and then to wire that up with the UI, we actually just have this tabs component and we have a tab button which references the route that we want to load up. So over here, tab equals tab one is a direct reference to the path tab one. Fairly simple. Now as we navigate throughout our app, we can tab across each part of the app and know that all those animate, all the transitions and all the history and state maintained in each tab is completely isolated and can be linked back and forth uh, and change the app, uh, the tab bar UI automatically. Uh, this is what we call stack navigation and it's really an, uh, an example of how we're bringing like, some native UX to the web, uh, but also embracing the good parts of the web like URLs and being able to share that and link that to, uh, your, uh, to other people. Let's take a history lesson part two. Who remembers build tools around 2015? Probably Grunt, Gulp, maybe some people were using Browserify? Probably not. Webpack apparently existed in 2015, which was really interesting, I didn't know that. Uh, translation systems, we had six to five, the really early versions of Babel. Uh, Tracer, which was an option. There was this really interesting thing called AtScript. I don't think it ever took off. And that was a joke. Um, but there's so many more options these days and if you actually go on uh, Hacker News, you're gonna find, hey, check out my new build tool and then, hey, why is this one different from that one? And I don't know. It's kind of confusing. Uh, I'm, I just wanna watch this one more time. Uh, I really don't know the difference between most of these tools and I doubt everyone in the uh, in JavaScript ecosystem does. I do know one thing though, they're all fairly good. So you can pick whatever tool you want to use and you're going to have a good experience. More importantly, as an Angular developer, I don't really need to worry about any of these tools because the CLI handles that for me. So I mentioned that to talk about our tool that we built with Ionic 2 and 3. 
app scripts. Now, app scripts, I have a really, I have a love-hate relationship with app scripts. I love it because we were able to do a lot of awesome things before the Angular CLI. What I really hated about it was the fact that I'd have to go through and manage all these weird dependencies with Webpack, upgrade, add features, and not work on my core components. It was not what I wanted to do. I'm a component developer. I don't want to deal with build systems, hence the sad Affleck. Uh, and it kind of got into the same part as the router, where we had the Angular way of doing things, and then the Ionic way of doing things. And it really just caused a whole bunch of confusion. So I hope you can see where we're going with this. We moved over to the Angular CLI. Uh, it really simplifies all of these um, dependencies that we need to worry about in Ionic, but also is easier for users because now we just have one setup for building our apps. Just circle around this one idea, use, hey, what's this option in Angular CLI? Cool, that automatically applies to an Ionic app. When Bazel comes out, we can adopt that feature without having to go through and recreate it uh, for specifically for Ionic apps. Uh, so one setup that was really great. But I, again, I said we have opinions about how certain things should be done in Ionic. And so that's where we created this idea of uh, an Angular toolkit. It's essentially a collection of custom builders, uh, schematics that really fit to an Ionic and a mobile app experience. Lazy loaded uh, components by default, it can handle your native builds for iOS and Android. And it even has a ng add option. So if you want to incrementally adopt Ionic into your already existing app, ng add at Ionic Angular, and it'll handle all that for you. Now, we talked about a lot of the things that we did with Angular. There's still actually some awesome things that came in Ionic 4 that I just want to go over it real quick. Uh, has anyone ever used CSS variables? A few people. Uh, they're really awesome. And I was a, I really doubted them at first, but now that I can do dark mode by just changing a few different variables, I am completely sold. I don't need JavaScript. I don't need SAS. I can just use CSS variables and get, you know, dynamic themes. And if you're wondering, uh, this is actually the only CSS that I need to change. For reference, the background color got switched to dark, the text got switched to the light color, and this whole step color business on the, uh, beneath actually was generated by our docs. Uh, I gave in the dark color and the light color, and it generated everything in between. So you don't actually need to write this. Uh, we've also made huge improvements with our server-side rendering story. So as uh, progressive web apps start to become more commonplace, having that initial uh, time, to, uh, having that initial paint, um, and having your app load super quickly, it's kind of a no-brainer. You want to have a fast app. So with the Ionic Server module, which should be coming out in one of our uh, new, newer releases, it integrates and can uh, server-side render all of your components, but also do cool things like pre-render that initial route. So as soon as the app loads up, you're going to see like some tab bar or some UI interface to let your user know, hey, things are going to load, and here's the, here's the landscape of my app before it even bootstraps. And this is part where actually I would like to get some feedback uh, afterwards. Uh, we're looking to potentially replace our virtual scroller with the CDK scroller. Uh, we've, we've maintained our own virtual scroller, but as soon as Angular released the virtual scroller for the CDK, we were able to see a much uh, smoother user experience. It was much faster. And I think the fact that it was an Angular-driven solution kind of makes sense for the long term of things. Uh, we can just depend on what Angular says is the best way to do virtual scrolling, and we can just throw in all of uh, the Ionic components in there and let it just render that. Now, we are traditionally uh, focused on mobile, but as things like progressive web apps and installable desktop progressive web apps become, uh, become popular with Chrome, and even Edge nowadays, uh, we want to make sure that our components look great, not only on the smallest devices, but on these huge 1080p screens that you could get. So uh, this is something that we are actively looking for feedback and to hear your stories. Uh, what have you been building if you've been building Ionic and using it on the desktop? What are some pain points? What are some components that you wish were better optimized uh, for the larger screens? So please, please find me, and I want to I know what your pain points are. And this brings us to the stack. Now, this is what I would consider 
the holy grail. I have Ionic as my UI. I have some plugins that we offer. I'm using Angular to build my app. I have deployment targets for iOS, Android, Progressive Web App, and Electron. I don't really have to change how my app is built or how that code is uh, uh, executed. It just knows through the build which platform to build for and which platform uh, APIs it should include. And really that 100% like reuse is uh, what we're trying to get. And this is where I kind of want to show Capacitor. Has anyone ever heard of Capacitor? You probably came by our booth. Um, Capacitor is our new approach for building apps cross-platform with uh, web technology as the core, so HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but also rethinking how the native layer is traditionally done. So for this example, imagine trying to write a file. Nothing about this code actually screams, hey, I'm on iOS, do this, or hey, I'm on uh, Chrome, do this, or what about Electron? With the way Capacitor works, you have this really simple uh, abstraction that you can work with, and it knows after it's been built, hey, I'm on Electron, handle it this way. Or hey, I'm on iOS, here's how I should work. This is probably one of the most exciting things uh, that we have coming, and we're actually actively working on an ng add option, so if you want to add that to maybe not even an Ionic app, but your traditional Angular app, you can start working with this soon. Uh, I will finish it hopefully by the end of the week. And that kind of gets us to where our uh, goals have been. By refocusing and letting Angular actually own certain pieces and us kind of taking a step back, we've been able to work on this capacitor, our theming overhaul, server-side rendering, making Ionic great while leveraging and reusing all the pieces of Angular and being able to take advantage of what's already been built on the platform. Angular is great. And then being able to reuse that just makes sense. Thank you.